Hi everyone, so today we're looking at Black Beauty, the next two chapters. Um, so let's get started. I'll just scroll down. Remember yesterday we looked at chapter 32 and 33 and you should have made a storyboard for that. And so if you look, gosh, we've got quite a way through the book at the moment. I should really remember what page we're on. Oh, that might be a little bit too far. There we are, where are we up to? There we are, very close. 32, 33, so today we're 34 and 35. Oh no, they're singing again. Well, I won't try singing for you. I wouldn't want it to rain. So 34, an old war horse. Captain had been broken in and trained for an army horse. His first owner was an officer of the cap of cavalry was an officer of cavalry going out to the Crimean War. He said he quite enjoyed the training with all the other horses, trotting together, turning together to the right hand or the left, halting at the word of, a, of command or dashing forward at full speed at the sound of a, the trumpet or a signal of the officer. He was, when young, a dark dapple, dappled iron grey and considered very handsome. His master, a young high-spirited gentleman, was very fond of him and treated him from the first with the greatest care and kindness. He told me that he told me he thought the life of an army horse was very pleasant, but when it came to being sent abroad overseas in a great ship, he almost changed his mind. That part of it, said he, was dreadful. Of course, we could not walk off the land into the ship, so they were obliged to put strong straps under our bodies, and then we were lifted off our legs in spite of our struggles, and were swung through the air over the water to the deck of the great vessel. There we were placed in small closed stalls, and never for a long time saw the sky, or were able to stretch our legs. The ship sometimes rolled out in high wings, and we were knocked about and felt bad enough. I'm sure they probably got some seasickness on that. However, at last it came to an end, and we were hauled up and swung over on again to the land. We were very glad and snorted and neighed for joy when we once more felt the firm ground under our feet. We soon found that the country we had come to was very different from our own and that we had many hardships to ensure besides fight the fighting, but many of the men were so fond of their horses that they did everything they could to make them comfortable in spite of snow, wet and all things out of order. But what about the fighting, said I? Was not that, the wor was not that worse than anything else? Well, said he, I hardly know. We always like to hear the trumpet sound and to be called out and were impatient to start off though sometimes we had to stand for hours waiting for the word of command and when the word was given we used to spring forward as gaily and eagerly as if there were no cannonballs bayonets or bullets i believe so long as we felt our rider firm in the saddle and his hand steady on the bridle not one of us gave way to fear not even when the terrible bombshells whirled through the air and burst into a thousand pieces I, with my noble master, went into many actions together without a wound, and though I saw horses shot down with bullets, pierced through with lances, and gashed with fearful sabre cuts, though we left them dead on the field or dying in the agony of their wounds, I don't think I feared for myself. My master's cheery voice, as he encouraged his men, made me feel as if he and I could not be killed. I had such great trust in him that when he, while he was riding me, I was ready to charge up the very cannon's mouth. I saw many brave men cut down, many fall mortally wounded from their saddles, and I heard the cries and groans of the dying. I had cantered over the overground slippery with blood and frequently had to try and avoid and to turn aside to avoid trampling on wounded man or horse, but until one dreadful day I had never felt terror. That day I shall never forget. Here old captain paused for a while and drew a long breath. I waited and he went on. It was one autumn morning, and as usual, an hour before daybreak, our cavalry had turned out, ready cap cap caparisoned for the day's work. Whether it might be fighting or waiting, the men stood by their horses, waiting, ready for orders. As the light increased, there seemed to be some excitement among the officers, and before the day was well begun, we heard the firing of the enemy's guns. Then one of the officers rode up and gave word for the men to mount and in a second every man was in his saddle and every horse stood expecting the touch of the rein or the pressure of his rider's heels, all animated, all eager, but still we had been trained so well that except by the champing of our bits, the 
the restive tossing of our heads from time to time, it could not be said that we stirred. My dear master and I were at the head of the line, and as all sat motionless and watchful, he took a little stray lock of my mane, which he had turned over the wrong side, laid it over on the right side, and smoothed it down with his hand. Then, patting my neck, he said, We shall live, we shall have a day of it today, Bayard, my beauty, but we'll do our duty as we have done. He stroked my neck that morning more, I think, than he ever had done before, quietly on and on, as if he were thinking of something else. I loved to feel his hand on my neck and arched my crest proudly and happily, but I stood very still, for I knew all his moods, and when he liked me to be quiet and when gay. I cannot tell all that happened on that day, but I will tell of the last charge that we made together. It was across a valley, right in front of the enemy's cannon. By this time we were well used to the roar of heavy guns, the rattle of musket fire and the flying shot near us. But never had I been under such fire as we rode through on that day. From the right, from the left, from the front, shot and shell poured it upon us. Many a brave man went down, many a horse fell, flinging his rider to the earth. Many a horse without a rider ran wildly out of the ranks. Then, terrified at being alone, with no hand to guide him, came pressing in amongst his old companions to gallop with them to the charge. Fearful as it was, no one stopped, no one turned back. Every moment the ranks were thinned. But as our comrades fell, we closed in to keep them together. And instead of being shaken or staggered in our pace, we, our gallop became faster and faster as we neared the cannon. My master, my dear master, was cheering on his comrades with his right arm raised on high. When one of the balls whizzing close by my head struck him, I felt him stagger with the shock, though he had to cry. I checked my speed, but the sword dropped from his right hand. The rein fell loose from the left, and sinking backward from the saddle, he fell to the earth. The other, oh, there we go. Fortunately, that's just gone off. Where are we up to? Stop sharing. Go back to sharing. I want to know what happened. There we go. The other, um, there we go. The other riders swept past us, and by the force of their charge, I was driven from the spot. I wanted to keep my place by his side, not leave him under that brush of horses' feet. But it was in vain, and now without a master or a friend, I was alone on that great slaughter ground. Then fear took hold of me, on me, and I trembled as I had never trembled before. And I too, as I had seen the other horses do, tried to join in the ranks and gallop with them. But I was beaten off by the swords of the soldiers. Just then a soldier whose horse had been killed under him caught at my bridle and mounted me. And with this new master, I was again going forward. But our gallant company was gallant, cruelly overpowered, and those who remained alive after the fierce fight for guns, for the guns came galloping back over the same ground. Some of the horses had been so badly wounded that they could scarcely move from the loss of blood. Other noble creatures were trying on three legs to drag themselves along, and others were struggling to rise on their four feet when their hind legs had been shattered by a shot. And after the battle, the wounded men were brought in and the dead were buried. And what about the wounded horses? I said, were they left to die? No, the army, fa army farriers went over the field with their pistols and shot all that were ruined. Some that only had slight wounds were brought back and attended to, but the greater part of the noble willing creatures that went out that morning never came back. In our stables, there was only about one in four that returned. I never saw my dear master again. I believe he fell dead from the saddle. I never loved any, any other master so well. I went into many other engagements, but was only once wounded, and then not seriously, and when the war was over, I came back again to England, as sound and strong as when I went out. I said, I've heard people talk about war as if it was a very fine thing. Ah, said he, I should think they never saw it. No doubt it is very fine when there is no enemy, but when it is just exercise and parade and sham fight. Yes, it's very fine then, but when thousands of good brave men and horses are killed or crippled for life, it has a very different look. Do you know what they fought about? said I. No, he said. That is more than a horse can understand. But the enemy must have been awfully wicked, people, if it was right to go all that way over the sea on purpose to kill them. I never knew a better knew a better man than my new master. He was kind and good and as strong. Oh, we're on chapter 35. We've just kept going. So in that chapter, that chapter is not a very happy chapter because we're looking at, they've described in quite quite a detailed way, the different ways that the horses died. Um, and I think the purpose of that chapter is that we're looking at the, it's looking at some sort of deeper themes that 
um, war can bring a lot of uh, innocent people into it, in a way, and a lot of them can get hurt or killed and never really know what they're fighting for or whether what they were fighting for was important. So it can be quite a, a tricky thing to talk about. And I think that chapter was probably um, aimed at those sorts of things because as um, the year sixes will know, that lots and lots of horses got killed in the wars. Um, so, yeah, that's quite a tricky chapter. But let's see whether or not chapter 35 is a bit more upbeat. So chapter 35, Jerry Barker. I never knew a better man than my new master. He was good, kind and good and as strong for the right as John Manley and so good-tempered and merry that very few people could pick a quarrel with him. He was very fond of making little songs and singing them to himself. One he was very fond of was this. Come father and mother and sister and brother, come all of you turn to and the help one another. And so they did. Harvey was as clever at stable work as a much older boy and always wanted to do what he could. Then Polly and Dolly used to come in in the morning to help with the cab, to brush and beat the cushions and rub the glass while Jerry was giving us a cleaning in the yard and Harry was rubbing the harness. There used to be a great deal of laughing and fun between them and it put Captain and me in much better spirits than if we had heard scolding and hard words. They were always... Uh, early in the morning for jerry would say if you in the morning throw 30 minutes away you can't pick them up in the course of the day you may hurry and scurry and worry flurry and worry you've lost them forever forever and a well that's a good saying i like that one we should put that on the wall in the classroom he could not bear any careless loitering and waste of time and nothing was so near making him angry as to find people who were always late wanting a cab horse to be driven hard to make up for their idleness one day, two wild-looking young men came out of a tavern close by the stand and called Jerry. Here, cabby, look sharp. We're rather late. Put on the steam, will you? And take us to, vi to the Victorian time for the one o'clock train. You shall have a shilling extra. I will take you at the regular pace, gentlemen. Shillings don't pay for putting on the steam like that. Larry's cab was standing next to ours. He flung open the door and said, I'm your man, gentlemen. Take my cab. My horse will get you there all right. And as he shut them in, with a wink toward Jerry, he said, it's against his conscience to go beyond a jog trot. Then slashing his jaded horse, he set off as hard as he could. Jerry patted me on the neck. No, Jack, a shilling would not pay for that sort of thing, would it? Although Jerry was determinedly set against hard driving to please careless people, he always went at a good fair pace and was not against putting on the steam, as he said, if only he knew why. I well remember one morning as we were on the stand waiting for a fare that a young man carrying a heavy portman portmanteau trod on a piece of orange peel which lay on the pavement and fell down with great force jerry was the first to run and lift him up he seemed much stunned and as they led him into the shop he walked as if he were in great pain jerry of course came back to the stand put it put in about 10 minutes but in about 10 minutes one of the shopmen called him so we drew up to the pavement can you take me to the south south eastern railway said the young man this unlucky fool has made me late i fear but it's of great importance that i should not lose the 12 o'clock train i should be most thankful if you could get me there in in time and will gladly pay you an extra fare i'll do my very best said jerry if you are think you're well enough sir for he looked dreadfully white and ill i must go he said earnestly please to open the door and let us lose no time the next minute jerry was on the box with a cheery chirrup to me and a twitch of the rein and that i well understood now then jack my boy he said spin along We'll show them how we can get over the ground, if only we know why. Oh, and Bruno's decided to go full hard dog ride. Bruno, quiet. Um, so he's, Jerry's saying that he's happy to go quickly, as long as he knows the reason for why he has to go quickly. So, for example, that person fell and hurt themselves, and that's why they were late, but he doesn't go quickly or rush his horse for the sake of somebody who's just been idle, which means they've been lazy. It's, it is always difficult to drive fast in the city in the middle of the day when the streets are full of traffic, but we did what could be done. And when a good driver and a good horse who understand each other are of one mind, it is wonderful what they can do. I had a very good mouth. That is, I could be guided by the slightest touch of the rain. And that is a great thing in London among carriages, omnibuses, carts, vans, trucks, cabs and great wagons creeping along at walking pace. 
Some going one way, some another, some going slowly, others wanting to pass them, omnibuses stopping short every three minutes to take up the passengers, obliging the horse that is coming up behind to pull up to or pass, or to pass, and get before them. Perhaps you try to pass, but just then something else comes dashing in through the narrow opening, and you have to keep in behind the omnibus again. Presently you think you see a chance and manage to get to the front, going so near the wheels on each side that half an inch nearer, and they would scrape. Well, you get along for a bit, but soon you find yourself in a long train of carts and carriages, all obliged to go at a walk. Perhaps you come to a regular block-up and have to stand still for minutes together till something clears out in the side street or the policeman interferes. You have to be ready for any chance to dash forward if there be an opening and be quick as a rat dog to see if there be room and if there be time, lest you get your own wheels locked or smashed or the shaft of some other vehicle, vehicle run into your chest or shoulder. All this is what you have to be ready for. If you want to get through London fast in the middle of the day, it wants a deal of practice. So it still wants a deal of practice because if you changed all those uh, cart-related um, words for car-related words, and if you've been to London, I'm sure you'll see have seen how busy it is. Jerry and I were used to it, and no one could beat us at getting through when we were set upon it. I was quick and bold and could always trust my driver. Jerry was quick and patient at the same time and could trust his horse, which was a great thing too. He very seldom used the whip. I knew by his voice and his click-click when he wanted to get on fast and by the rein where I was to go, so there was no need for whipping, but I must go back to my story. The streets were very full that day, but we got on pretty well as far as the bottom of Cheapside, where there was a block... For three or four minutes, the young man put his head out and said anxiously, I think I'd better get out and walk. I shall never get there if this goes on. I'll do all that can be done, sir, said Jerry. I think we should be in time. This block up cannot last much longer and your luggage is very heavy for you to carry, sir. Just then the cart in front of us began to move on and we, and then we had a good turn. In and out, in and out, we went as fast as a horse flesh could do it. For, um, for I wonder had a good clear time on London Bridge but there was a whole train of cabs and carriages all going our way at quick trot, perhaps wanting to catch that very train. At any rate, we whirled into the station with many more, just as the great, pant great clock pointed to eight minutes to twelve o'clock. Thank God we're in time, said the young man, and thank you too, my friend, and your good horse. You have saved me more than money can ever pay for. Take this extra half a crown. No, sir, no, thank, thank you all the same. So glad we hit the time, sir, but don't say stay, sir. The bell is ringing. Here, Porter, take this gentleman's luggage. Dover line, 12 o'clock train. That's it. And without waiting another word, Jerry wheeled me around to make room for other cabs that were dashing up at the last minute and drew up on the one side till the crush was passed. So glad, he said. So glad. Poor young fellow. I wonder what it was that made him so anxious. Jerry often talked to himself, to himself quite loud enough for me to hear when we were not moving. On Jerry's return to the rank, there was a good deal of laughing and chafing chaffing at him for driving hard to the train for an extra fee as they as they said all against his principles and they wanted to know how much he'd pocketed a good deal more than i generally get he said nodding slyly what he gave me will keep me in little comforts for several days gammon said one he's a humbug said another preaching to us then doing the same himself look here mate said jerry that gentleman the gentleman offered me half a crown extra but i didn't take it it was quite enough pay to in a quite pay enough to, for me to see how glad he was to catch that train and if jack and i chose to have a quick run now and then to please ourselves that's our business not yours well said larry you'll never be a rich man most likely not said jerry but i don't know that i shall be the less happy for that i've heard the com commandments read a great many times, and i never noticed that any of them said thou shalt be rich and there are a good many curious things said in the new testament about rich men that i think would make me feel rather queer if i was one of them if you ever do get rich, said Governor Gray, looking over his shoulder across the top of his cap, you'll deserve it, Jerry, and you won't find a curse upon curse come with your wealth. As for you, Larry, you'll die poor. You spend too much in whipcord. Well, said Larry, what is a fellow to do if his horse won't go without it? You never take the trouble to see if he will go without it. Your whip is always going as if you had the St. Viticus dance in your arm, and it does not wear you... you does not wear you out it wears your horse out you know you're always changing your horses and why because you never give them any peace or encouragement well i have not had good luck said larry that's where it is and you never will said the governor good luck is rather particular who she, who she rides with and mostly prefers those who have got common sense and a good heart at least that is my experience governor gray turned around again to his newspaper and the other men went to their cabs 
So there we have it. Chapter 36 you'll be on next week. Um, if you head over to Purple Mash, you'll be seeing the... Oh, there we go. If you head over to Purple Mash, I'm hoping that that had shared. And you've not just been seeing me reading it, but if you have, the uh, section will be up underneath as usual. So you can always just put it on and read along as I'm reading. Um, I don't know if I press share the screen. Hoping I did. If... <laughs> If you go over to Purple Mash, you'll find your activity for today. Um, more than likely a quiz. So um, I will be doing the art video for next week. So I look forward to seeing your lovely creations. Mr. Harris will be back with your next part of uh, Black Beauty, where I'm sure you're going to read the next 10 or so chapters. And I'm personally looking forward to see what happens because I think it sounds like Jerry seems like a really nice person and that Black Beauty's ended up in quite a nice place. Much nicer, it seems, than Larry. So um, have a lovely weekend anyway. Stay safe. Make sure that you're abiding by all the rules and, um, and make sure that you have a rest as well so that you're all fresh, ready for Monday and the next piece of work that you'll have been set. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>